if we look at silicon as a starting material for producing a solar cell, where we obviously want as much sunlight uh, absorbed, captured as possible, if we look at silicon, we don't do anything to the surface. It actually reflects a lot of light back. Um, silicon can be, if you polish it, it's a quite good mirror. If you've worked with a polished silicon wafer, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent mirror. Uh, that means it reflects a lot of light, and that's not ideal. So we need to do as much as we can to reduce the reflection from the su front surface. Reflection loss is a very uh, direct loss, you could say. If the light that comes from the sun is reflected away from the cell before it even reaches the bulb, uh, it's lost. It's not like you get a second chance with that light unless you do something to, 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 to get that. So we want to minimize reflectance uh, across the spectrum of wavelengths that's relevant. Um, what's being done today uh, for uh, silicon cells is, uh, first of all, a surface texturing, which both for mono and multicrystalline is a wet uh, chemical etch. It's a, it's a different etching process for mono compared to multi. And that's because in monocrystalline silicon that are being textured the most um, effectively, you could say, uh, the texturing process involves and depends on etch rates and etch rate differences in the crystal planes in silicon. So if you take a monocrystalline silicon wafer where crystal planes uh, in, uh, within the entire bulk are aligned, and you dip it into potassium hydroxide, KOH, for example, it could also be sodium hydroxide, um, at the right mixture with water, and maybe a little uh, uh, alcohol in it, you will actually get uh, quite perfect microscale pyramids. And those pyramids are defined by huge differences in the etch rate between the different uh, crystallographic planes in, in uh, monocrystalline silicon. So dipping it into that mixture will create uh, pyramids with a, an angle that's perfectly defined by the crystal planes uh, in silicon. And those pyramids will be on the order of five microns in, in size. And those pyramids work very well as texturing for silicon cells because when the light hits the side, the tilted side of such a pyramid, uh, it will bounce uh, off at, at an angle uh, and hit, on average, at least one other side of, of an adjacent or a neighbor pyramid. And that means that if it hits, uh, if a photon hits a surface uh, with a 10% reflection, maybe we put an anti-reflective coating on that I'll get back to that made, made the reflection 10%, then instead of 10%, it gets two chances on 10% reflective surfaces, and that becomes 10% of 10%, and, and suddenly we're, um, we're down to 1%. So that's how the, the pyramids and, and this type of microscale texturing uh, works. Uh, multicrystalline silicon cells are textured in a different wet uh, etching process um, because in a multicrystalline wafer the crystal planes are not aligned as in, in monocrystalline so the um, the KOH texturing doesn't the pyramid texturing doesn't work as as well so in multicrystalline it's it's more effective to to choose an acidic bath that creates a rough surface uh, but it's not as effective, and that means even with an anti-reflective coating, a multicrystalline wafer reflects uh, on average 8% over the, the solar spectrum. The second measure that we do um, to reduce the reflection is an anti-reflective coating. And that works in a different way. Uh, it typically consists of a 75 nanometer uh, silicon nitride coating um, deposited by uh, PECVD, which is Plasma Enhanced uh, Chemical Vapor Deposition. And this uh, silicon nitride is basically optimized in terms of its uh, refractive index. So if you're a photon traveling through the sky, uh, you go through air with a refractive index of 1, and you want to enter silicon with a refractive index of approximately 4, depending on the wavelength, but it's uh, around four for, for most of the wavelengths we look at. Um, if you put in a material with 
an intermediate refractive index. The light is being, you'd say, bent into the material instead of being reflected away. So uh, the more abrupt change in, ref in a refractive index, the higher the reflection. Uh, and to sort of work with that uh, mechanism, we put in a coating with an intermediate um, refractive index to minimize reflection. This effect is, is wavelength dependent, and when you look at the reflection uh, for different wavelengths from a standard industrial silicon solar cell, you'll see that it's it's very carefully minimized at a certain wavelength. And if you match that with the solar spectrum, you can see why that the industry has looked carefully into which wavelength do we want to minimize. Now, if cost wasn't an issue and we could do whatever we wanted, maybe we wanted to add an, an additional layer uh, an additional anti-reflective coating, then we could in principle minimize two wavelengths. And if we could increase that and have an infinite number of anti-reflective coatings, we could start getting a broadband um, minimization of, of the reflection. And actually it's, it's kind of what we want to do with our black silicon nanostructures, because if you get, you nanostructure the silicon surface, what you do is basically you nanostructure the interface between air and silicon. And if you model that from a refractive index perspective, you get a gradual increase in refractive index going from that of air to that of silicon. So not in an abrupt way, but in a gradual way. And when I say that, I mean from the perspective of a photon. So it has to be on the order of uh, the wavelength, uh, and that means on nanoscale. And that's why nanostructures like black silicons can suppress reflection over a broadband of wavelengths and not just one. Nanoscale texturing kind of represents, you could say, the dream of an infinite la uh, layer of infinitely thin uh, anti-reflective coatings tailored to, to the solar spectrum. Uh, but in practice, it's, it becomes an alternative to the, to the texturing uh, process used in the industry today. My work is primarily focused around black silicon, which is basically defined as nanostructured silicon or a nanostructured silicon surface that becomes extremely black and anti-reflective because of the nanostructures. Um, I've worked with this technology since my bachelor project back in 2010, where we mostly looked at the material properties and produced some some uh, quite poor solar cells just to demonstrate that it, it was possible to make the nanostructures and complete the, the self-application and measure uh, an efficiency. And since then, throughout my master and PhD, we've tried to optimize the efficiency and combine black silicon with different measures of passivation and, and creating the emitter uh, of the solar cell uh, within these nanostructures and so on. Um, we produce nanostructures that are three to 400 nanometers uh, high or uh, tall and uh, spaced or, or placed three to 400 uh, nanometers apart from each other. So uh, if you look at the surface of black silicon in an electron microscope, you'll see this big landscape of three to 400 nanometer conical-like hillocks that are placed in a random nature uh, on the surface. And that's because our process is a, a quite simple one-step process with no masking. So that means we don't use lithography to define where the nanostructure should be. Uh, we design a process with the certain parameters so that the nanostructures automatically form where we want them to be. Uh, but it is a, a controlled random process in that we can control it uh, so that we can produce thousands of wafers that uh, have the same uh, properties when it comes to solar cell production. Uh, but if you look in the electron microscope, uh, the nanostructures are created in a random nature. Uh, we use what's called maskless reactive iron etching. So in reactive iron etching, you basically introduce reactive gases that uh, chemically etch silicon and also physically sputter silicon. And if you control those two chemical and physical mechanisms, you can create a nanostructured surface without having to define a, a pattern uh, with, for example, lithography. This is important because if we want to scale such a process, uh, typically lithography is too expensive and not scalable enough. So there are different ways of producing black silicon. Uh, other groups uh, 
use uh, wet etching with, uh, for example, metal-assisted chemical etching, where metal nanoparticles define where we want to etch uh, grooves or, or small holes on nanoscale, and where the holes are not etched, uh, we have uh, structures. And that's another way of creating uh, black silicon. You can also use a, a laser with certain uh, parameters and create uh, uh, black silicon. We use maskless uh, reactive ion etching. Um, and the result is, uh, on nanoscale, this random uh, pattern of conical-like hillocks. And on macro scale, it's extremely black and uh, uh, anti-reflective uh, silicon surface. Another interesting feature of nanostructured uh, silicon or black silicon is that it's actually not just anti-reflective when we look at it at normal incidence, which as researchers we typically measure the cell at normal incidence, that is um, the, the direction of the light beam is orthogonal to the, uh, to the solar cell plane. Um, but in real life we know that if we place a solar cell on a fixed roof, we don't, uh, we don't move the cell, then the direction of the light will vary uh, throughout the day, throughout the year. Uh, if it's cloudy weather, the light will probably be uh, diffusely scattered. So if you look at the effective light hitting the cell, it will be um, a mixture of a lot of incident angles. Um, and the interesting thing is, at least on cell level, uh, we haven't tested it on full panel level yet, but on cell level, we see that black silicon is much less uh, dependent on the incident angle, both when it comes to reflection, but actually also when it comes to uh, efficiency uh, of the cell. So that means that if you compare two cells, one being microstructured and one being nanostructured, and they're otherwise identical in terms of performance, actually the, the nanostructured cell would outperform the microstructured cell if you vary the incident angle. Um, but again, this has to be tested on panel level. Remember, in a panel, you, you put on uh, a laminate like EVA and you put on a protective glass. These things affect the optical uh, system. Um, but on, on solar cell level, it's interesting to see that when you change the surface, uh, maybe you make nanostructures like we do, you don't only change the normal incidence performance optically and electrically, you also change the uh, incident angle uh, dependent performance um, and it has to do with uh, this nanostructured interface that makes a gradual change in refractive index from air to silicon. If you vary the angle you could imagine that that, that gradual change or that change will still be gradual. Uh, it still goes through uh, a gradual increase from air to silicon when we look at the refractive index. At some point we reach uh, the Brewster angle where we have uh, reflection, uh, high, high reflection, uh, also on black silicon. But there is sort of a, a broad range of incident angles uh, in our studies up to say 45, 50 degrees from normal uh, on, on both sides where the reflection remains below 1%, so where the cell still looks black. And this is a feature that we hope to, to be able to benefit from in future black silicon solar cells, but it's important to test it on full scale in real panels.